All right. Uh, welcome to everybody. My name is Keisha Jackson. I am with Microsoft. I'm the digital strategy lead for Microsoft Partner Community. And today we have Paul White from Dinosaurs who's going to take us through a presentation. And this is part of a month long series that's going to be happening uh, on a weekly cadence featuring different experts connected with Dinosaurs and their research and their business. So, Paul, we'll just turn it over to you to lead the presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever this podcast finds you, uh, on a plane, on a train or at home, uh, I hope you're well. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join and uh, listen. Um, we're grateful to Microsoft for the opportunity to put this series together. Uh, we've pulled together a group of people to share their thoughts on a very broad subject, channel economics in an era of technological disruption. Next time out, in a week's time, you'll hear from Dana Wilmer, the founder of a company called CloudSpeed. CloudSpeed do some really interesting work for vendors like Microsoft and individual partners like yourselves to really understand the transition that our industry is in. The week after, you'll hear from Mike Ward, VP of Cloud at Tech Data in the US. Tech Data were Microsoft's global partner of the year last year. We work with them very closely, closely and we're excited about what Tech Data are doing to help their partner community uh, make the most of the opportunity ahead. And the last episode in the series uh, will be run by Catcher on my team. He'll tell you a little bit more about dinosaurs. In tackling the subject of channel economics in an era of technological disruption, um, I think all four speakers, myself included, are going to bring our own take on the subject. Uh, and in doing that, I know the thing that we've all got in common is a real passion for the partner community. Uh, and more specifically, I think we all share a conviction that the channel's got a really exciting future, driven by the customer demand for the innovation in technology that's all around us right now. But as I say, um, I get to go first. My name's Paul White. Uh, I'm CEO at Dinosaurs. We're a startup based in Amsterdam that's seeking to bring greater transparency and visibility to the IT services market. Before joining Dinosaurs, uh, I worked for Microsoft. And before that, I ran a partner in the UK. And before that, worked for a number of different business application vendors. Um, so the views that I'm about to express are personal. That's why these slides are unbranded. Uh, they clearly reflect my history in the industry, um, both the different places that I've worked and some of the great people that I've had the opportunity to work with. So let me start by framing uh, the opportunity that's in front of us. Um, I think the opportunity for the channel is described at a very high level, very adequately by Gartner. Uh, Gartner recently reported that the IT industry is going to be worth a total of 3.8 trillion in 2019. And within that, IT services spend was up 8%, busting through the $1 trillion button barrier for the first time. Beneath these top level numbers, uh, I think there's a much bigger story, which is to do with the extent to which spending is being switched from technologies that we know and love today and that we've known and loved for many years uh, towards new technologies, AI, machine learning, IoT, uh, all the stuff that we're really excited about. Now, whilst they're not quite as big as Gartner, uh, CloudSpeed also have some very interesting things to say about the opportunity that is in front of the channel. Specifically, they've got data that talks to the extent to which partners are currently uh, seeing the upside that we're all looking for uh, from the transition in our industry. Specifically, I'm referencing there, you know, the opportunity to serve more customers more quickly with a faster sales cycle and a lower cost of sale. I'm thinking there about lifetime value of customers being greater than perhaps ever before, driven by a greater services opportunity on an ongoing basis and the opportunity to build individual IP at a partner level and improve margins that way. 
So I think we're all clear on the promise that cloud uh, continues to offer. Um, but that green arrow is dashed because cloud speed tell us not everyone is feeling that upside just yet. What they do tell us is that some of the real challenges associated with the shift to subscription, specifically the reduction in the margin and cash that partners might enjoy uh, up front in the deal, are really beginning to hit home, uh, creating a squeeze on many partners, which may indeed speak to quite a lot of the M&A activity that we see in the sector right now. And the specific title of this first podcast is Challenges for the Channel. Uh, and I think that channel is frankly really simple. It's you know, what do we need to do as a collective community? And I mean their vendors, distributors and partners, resellers themselves. What do we need to do to make the most of the opportunity that technological disruption really represents? Uh, and I think that issue really comes down to one thing, which is, have we got the necessary capacity to serve the opportunity that's ahead of us? Do we collectively employ all the people, enough of the right people, with the right product skills and the right industry experience to deliver on the opportunity that IoT, machine learning, cloud, etc., all represent? I'd suggest that the consensus of opinion on that subject is no. Uh, I don't think anyone really believes that the IT industry currently employs the right number of people with the right skills. Uh, now, I think there are many different reasons for that. Uh, I've listed some of them here. And I'm sure that in different economies, in different geographic markets, the reasons will perhaps appear in a different order. But I think the fundamental problem remains uh, and is entirely consistent worldwide. Uh, the problem is that as an industry, I think we've been talking about this for some time. And I think we've seen different participants in the channel, whether it's vendors like Microsoft or individual resellers, really start to try and tackle it in their own ways. You know, I've seen a number of partners run really good graduate trainee programs. Um, I've seen distributors try to step into that space as well. Um, perhaps the most exciting initiative I've seen recently is a thing called the Cloud Society uh, that is driven by Microsoft, which is making a, a really significant impact. It's driven out of the Middle East in training large numbers of people onto Azure. If you've not come across Cloud Society before, um, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, it's a really significant move on Microsoft's part, and I know they're rolling it out globally. Uh, it's worth a look. But however good that program is, and it's good, I don't think any of us should sleep soundly at night believing that the capacity problem that we face is behind us. Uh, it's not. So in trying to think through that capacity problem for myself, I reflected on our industry as a history. More specifically, I ended up drawing a pyramid which attempted to represent our kind of supply chain structure. Now, the pyramid's a gross oversimplification, um, so indulge me or let me apologize for that. But what I've tried to do is just simply represent the nature of the industry as it's developed, really around a product push mentality. So vendors shipped product to distributors who shipped product to resellers who had sales professionals on staff. And I'd argue that that model that most people understood to be the sell-through model was frankly optimized for upfront sales and perhaps implicitly optimized for vendor convenience. The sell-through model perhaps started with hardware. It kind of grew to carry software. 
uh, and is now being asked to support the sale of cloud services, which might be a bit of an ask. Now, in this sell-through model, I'd suggest that channel capacity has historically been defined by sales resource. I think that we've all been, rightly, fascinated by the number of salespeople that we've had on staff, the ratio between the number of customers they look after and the number of salespeople we've got, what quota cover we've got for the business plan we've signed up to, what pipeline cover, and an endless series of incentives uh, designed to try and get the salespeople to sell uh, the things that we, someone in the supply chain, wants to get them to sell. And I think that uh, it's that fascination for uh, sales resource that reveals uh, the organizing principle that we, we've been working to. Uh, and by organizing principle, uh, I mean this. Uh, and I've lent here on Wikipedia for a definition. An organizing principle is fundamentally a reference point, a reference point around which other entities can be positioned and somewhat related to each other. So I wanted to take this opportunity, this podcast, to perhaps suggest that it might be time for the channel, the collective of vendors, distributors, resellers, to perhaps reflect on that organizing principle and decide whether it should stay that way. I think we're all ready to agree that you know, we're moving away from pushing product to customers. I think we all now understand that our future is going to be defined by the extent to which customers choose to consume more of the stuff that we've got to offer. So if the sell-through business model was optimized for vendor convenience, uh, I'd suggest that can no longer be the case. Going forward, in the context of the consumption model, everything we do needs to be optimized for adoption, active usage, real business value for the customer. So I think the switch from product push to consumption pull is significant enough to warrant redrawing the diagram. So I did so and ended up inverting the pyramid, putting customers at top and, no disrespect, vendors at the bottom. I also took the liberty of making one other key change. In my view, as I've said, sales resource was the key engine of the sell-through model. I'd venture to suggest that service resource is fundamentally going to take a lead role in driving consumption. And it's on that basis that I think we should think about service resource as becoming the organizing principle for this industry. I think as a collective, we need to be preoccupied by the number of services people that we employ. We need to understand what technology skills they've got, what industry skills they've got to offer, and we need to be pushing for 100% certification, not the minimum that's required to achieve a vendor standard in terms of gold, silver, or bronze. And my hypothesis is that it's only when we put the services resources at the center of our thinking that we're really gonna solve that capacity problem. So a number of you may be thinking that changing the organizing principle might sound a little theoretical. Uh, others may buy that organizing principle idea, but believe that switching from sales resource to services resource might sound a bit dramatic. Um, both groups might be right. But let me try and bring us together uh, this way. Um, given the scale of the change in our industry, and the length of time that the sell-through business model has been in place, I think we can all agree that we should perhaps be asking questions about that sell-through business model's fitness for purpose. It just seems unlikely that the same supply chain structure should persist across such a big transition in our marketplace. 
And if it's time to think differently about how all the components in the supply chain work together, I think it would make sense to uh, think about how we could optimise for the biggest issue we face. Uh, and no doubt there are other issues in the industry, but I think most of us would agree that capacity would figure as being one of the top one or two. So on that basis, I'd, I'd like to invite us to inject a bit more balance into our thinking. Uh, instead of it being sales resource or service resource, let's have an and conversation. Uh, let's think about capacity in our industry uh, a bit more holistically, sales and services. So in upgrading our focus on service resource, I'd suggest that fundamentally, we need to start by managing services skills, um, industry expertise uh, on a much more proactive basis. And to do that, I think we really need to start by understanding what skills already exist, whether that's within each individual reseller, within a community of company like Tech Data, or indeed across the whole Microsoft partner estate. Do we know how many people are in there? Do we know what skills they've got? Do we know what industry expertise they've got to offer? I think the answer is no. I know the answer is no. Um, and I'd suggest that we need to start building a skills inventory to address that gap, because it's only when we know what we've got on staff that we can make a plan to fill the gaps created by all the opportunity that is ahead of us. At the same time as we do that, I think we might want to reflect on all the stuff that we've spent, all the money we've spent on our sales teams over the last 10 or 15 years. Whether that's money that we've spent on people development, sales training, whether it's the investments we've made in making sure our salespeople are you know, appropriately managed, the systems they use, the tools they use, and the incentives we offer. Because if sales resource have been the tip of the spear in the sell through model, and services teams are the tip of the spear in the consumption model, then maybe we need to rebalance what we've been spending across those two teams. Maybe it's time to start to invest more significantly in the people development management systems, tools and incentives that we offer our services teams. My third point on this slide would be to suggest that in effecting the transition or some rebalancing in terms of the way we think about uh, capacity, we should also reflect on the nature of our existing consulting business model. So, you know, being very honest here, I know that when I ran a partner, uh, I was on a mission to squeeze every chargeable day out of every individual project. That was the way that we drove profitability in that business at a time when it was all about upfront licensing. Um, now, going forward, I'm not sure that that model uh, has a place. I think that as an industry, we've got a responsibility to help customers simplify because it's in simplification that their opportunity for digital transformation uh, really exists. And it's only when we're out offering that kind of digital transformation value that I think we can look forward to increasing lifetime value, driving consumption as a result of adoption and active usage. So I think fundamentally, many of our consultants will need to decide whether they live in a business analysis world or bring technical competence to a party. Uh, but the idea of simply saying yes to the customer and delivering what the customer thinks they want may not be the way forward uh, on many projects. My last point here um, is that we perhaps 
need to think about the role of the practice manager. And by practice manager, I mean whoever it is who you ask to look after your service professionals, um, recruit them, develop them, lead them. Uh, that individual is the busiest individual that I know. It's one of the toughest roles in our industry. I think in the sell-through world, sales managers and sales directors have really been the big dogs in our industry. And I think it's probably time to upgrade practice managers to a similar level of equivalence. In my view, practice managers are unsung heroes, and we should, as we shift to the consumption model, kind of pull them out of the shadows and really empower that role. So fundamentally, you know, I think the biggest challenge for the channel is to proactively align uh, capacity and opportunity. Today, I think there's a really big delta between those two things, and we better find a way to fix it relatively fast. People like Gartner, Forrester, AMR, there are lots of people who can tell us about the size of the opportunity. But I said, suggest that the responsibility for measuring capacity really just falls to us. And establishing that baseline, the starting point for closing the, the skills gap that exists, uh, is where dinosaurs can help and where Katya will talk in three weeks' time. So we're not a product-based industry anymore. Uh, we're in a service-based industry in the broadest sense of the word, both the propositions that we take to market and deliver to customers uh, and the work of the people that we employ. I'd argue that it's time to put our services teams at the centre of our thinking uh, about the, how this supply chain is going to evolve uh, and that that represents our best hope of closing the gap between capacity and opportunity. Thank you for your time. Thanks for that presentation, Paul. Uh, we have about five minutes left, so I want to open it up to any uh, participants on the call for questions. You can either uh, just come off of mute and ask your questions or type it into the chat. All right, um, doesn't look like there's any questions. Just want to confirm no questions from the audience. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Paul. I know that I definitely learned a lot um, and it, I, I really appreciate how you framed the question or how you framed the presentation at the beginning, just laying out your vast amount of experience um, with different uh, segments of business of channel, of uh, working with partner, working at Microsoft, working in different areas. And so I really appreciate the the fact that your presentation was very much from your individual standpoint of over the, over the course of your career and not necessarily uh, with your affiliation with a particular particular company. I guess I will just uh, end this call by asking you one question uh, specific about, you know, having a wide range of experiences and given the topic, where do you think uh, you've learned the most about how to take on these challenges um, in terms of your business identity? Has it been during your time with Microsoft, your time during Dinosaurus with other uh, partners? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, listen, I think um, I'd have to confess that my time at Microsoft uh, really demonstrated what's possible if an organization uh, really wants to make something happen. Uh, clearly, Microsoft has uh, capacity to galvanize resources around a, an agenda, and it was great to be a part of that. Um, now, on the outside of Microsoft, uh, it's great to see the company really try and get after these capacity challenges. Mm -hmm. but and cloud society is a great example of that innovation but the problem's broader than microsoft right it's a multi-vendor world and we need to solve that problem for the customers we want to serve absolutely well th thank you for that insight on that note uh we can go ahead and conclude the recording